Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be continuing on with our Bible study series going through the book of James. I already did videos for chapter 1, 2, and 3, and those are all on my channel. So check those out if you haven't already. And then in today's video, we're going to be covering chapter 4. This is another chapter that's a little bit on the shorter side, like chapter 3. This one has 17 verses, but they're all packed full of good stuff as is the rest of this book and the whole bible so we'll just jump right into it as always i will read through the entire chapter out loud on camera and then we will pick one or two verses to dig a little deeper into and study more in depth so if you have one pull out a bible and we'll start reading verse one what causes quarrels and fights among you is it not this that your passions are at war within you and then I've got a little footnote in my Bible here that says passions can also mean pleasures or the Greek word that is used that we get passions from can also be translated pleasures. And so that sort of makes me think about how we've got these desires that are at war within us, much like what Paul talks about in Romans, how we have this desire to want to do good, but we don't do the things that we want to do. And instead we do the things that we don't want to do. So we have a desire to want to please God, hopefully, but then we also have a fleshly desire within us. And so James is saying that these desires and these passions are at war within us. Verse two, you desire and do not have, so you murder. And I want to pause right there before reading the rest of that verse, because I think we can automatically, if you haven't murdered anybody, count ourselves out of that verse. But I think back to what Jesus says in Matthew 5, that to have even that anger or that hatred in our heart toward another person makes us liable to judgment. And so James is saying we desire and we do not have, so we murder. And maybe for many people that hasn't actually led to murder, hopefully, but maybe that's led to hatred or anger or jealousy or bitterness because we have these desires and we don't have the things that we long for and so we have this rage or this hatred or this anger within us continuing on in verse two you covet and cannot obtain so you fight and quarrel you do not have because you do not ask sometimes i read that verse and i think man well i do ask and there are some things that i do ask for that i don't have but then you keep reading on in verse three which says you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions and this is really getting at a motivation question the things that we desire and the things that we are asking for what is our motivation in wanting those things and it explains that a little bit more continuing on in verse four which says you adulterous people do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And the fact that that sentence comes directly after this verse that is talking about asking for things and examining our motivations as to why we want the things we want makes me think that he is addressing here this desire for worldly things. Maybe this desire to measure up to the people next to us or to always have that next best thing because we think that that is what is going to make us okay or good or a esteemed or admired in the eyes of other people. And so he's addressing here this desire to have these worldly things or to, as he phrases it, to have this friendship with the world. But he is saying that in doing so, we make ourselves an enemy of God, that we cannot have both, that we are either a friend of God or a friend of the world. But I want to hop back up and make a note on verse three, where he is saying that we ask and do not receive because we ask wrongly to spend it on our own passions. So again, he is saying that we do not have because we maybe have these motivations that are seeking our own pleasures or worldly things rather than a good motivation which a good motivation would be for the glory of God asking for something because ultimately God is going to be glorified through it I just want to put a note there that I do think it is possible to ask and to have that godly motivation that God would be glorified through something. I think because we're human, inevitably our motivations are always going to be a little bit mixed. So we could be asking God for something and desiring something and wanting God to be glorified through it and also seeking our own pleasure in it. And I don't think that if we have not received the answer to the thing that we're asking, that it is always because our motivations are necessarily twisted. A lot of times they are, but we also have to remember that even the good things that we ask for that are godly and that are requested with a good motivation that God answers those things according to his will and his timing and so you might be asking for something that is good and your motivations for it might even be good and maybe you haven't seen an answer yet simply because it hasn't been God's timing yet or maybe it's not in his will and so I wanted to point that out because I think that if you have been asking for something and not receiving it you can read that verse and think oh I must have wrong motivations for this and maybe you do and it's certainly an opportunity to examine 
examine our motivations, but there's also the possibility that you could have good motivations in the thing that you're asking for. And again, maybe it's not within God's timing or his will at this moment. And on that note, I want to read a note from my study Bible that speaks to this verse. It says, you do not have because you do not ask is a reminder that believers should ask God for what they seek rather than fighting each other. And I think this speaks to that first part of the verse where it's talking about how our desires are causing fights and quarrels among us rather than fighting other people or maybe getting into this competition mindset that creates division and dissent when we see other people who have what we want that we don't have. Instead of that, we should be taking our request to God, remembering that he is powerful and that he is able to answer those prayers. And the commentary continues on to say that prayerlessness results in a failure to receive many of God's blessings. James does not imply that God's will is to grant sinful, selfish desires, but bringing requests before God can have a purifying influence on one's desires. And so James is reminding us here to pray because sometimes prayerlessness is the reason why we don't receive some of God's blessings. But again, he is saying that not everything that we ask for is going to be granted. But when we bring our desires before God, he is going to be refining them and aligning them with his desires for us. And so even if we aren't seeing an answer to the thing that we had initially wanted, over time as we're bringing that before God, he's going to be changing our desires to align with his will for our life. And I kind of talked a little bit more about that in my waiting on God's promises video if you want to dig more into that topic. Verse 5, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? And so again, God doesn't want our attention to be seeking after all of these worldly things that we think is going to bring us life that are things apart from him, but rather he wants our attention on him and he wants himself to be our heart's greatest desire. Verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Did you just feel that sigh of relief after that first part of verse six that says, but he gives more grace. So he is kind of presenting to us in the beginning of this chapter, what is in our hearts, this desire for these things that aren't God and how it creates these fights and these quarrels among us. But then it says, but God gives grace. And it says that he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So if we recognize the sinfulness in our heart, we recognize these conflicting desires within us and we are humble before God and we're not proud and thinking that we've got it all together and that we've got it figured out and that we don't actually struggle with those things but instead if we are humble God gives grace to the humble yet if we are proud and if we do think that we've got it all together we think that we don't have these struggles then it actually says that God opposes the proud and so it's saying in verse 7 to submit yourselves therefore to God you guys have probably heard this before but whenever you see a therefore in scripture you have to ask yourself what is it there for and so this statement is coming after talking about all these different things and it's saying, okay, here's kind of the issue in the human heart and here is the bad that it leads to. So knowing this, therefore, submit yourselves to God resist the devil and he will flee from you. That is a promise. And I think that that is a really good verse, just that little snippet to memorize for those moments of temptation. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That is also a promise and one of my personal favorites that as we seek God, as we draw near to God, that he will also draw near to you. That is so cool. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse nine, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. I love that verse because I think that's a pattern we see all throughout scripture that anytime somebody is exalted, one, God usually first takes them through a process of humbling them. I think of Joseph or David or anybody like that, but also with any of those people who are ultimately exalted to positions of power where God uses them in these crazy ways, God was the one to appoint them into that position. Our role is to humble ourselves before the Lord. Our role isn't to seek this exaltation of ourselves, but rather to humble ourselves before before the Lord and he will be the one to exalt. Verse 11, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks evil against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy. 
but who are you to judge your neighbor? This is echoing a lot of what we were talking about last week in chapter three, talking about our tongues and the capacity for evil in it, but to not speak evil against our brothers because judging is not our job. This verse says that there is only one lawgiver and one judge and it ain't us. It is God. He is the only one who is able to save and to destroy. So it is not our role to judge our neighbor. Verse 13, come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. I have heard this passage a lot of times, and I think one of the crazy things about the time that we're living in right now with the quarantine and everything going on in our world is I think we are finally starting to see this. We are living in the reality of this. And I talked about this more in my video on the coronavirus, but I think that one of the things this is doing is that it is taking away our false sense of control. That we are never in control, but I think that a lot of times we think that we are and now here we're in this space where we really can't plan we don't know what a month from now is going to look like we don't know when all of these restrictions are going to be lifted we don't know when life is going to go back to normal as we know it and as we go to make plans now there's almost this understood thing of well kind of depending on what happens I've heard people who are getting married even in like October or November or who have trips planned for that time say yeah this is the plan but you know depends on what happens with the coronavirus and the reality is is that that's all Always the case that we never know what tomorrow is going to bring we make these plans and feel so secure in them but we don't know and again that's always the case but I think right now more than ever our eyes are being opened to that reality that we don't know what tomorrow will bring and having this mentality as we are going about our lives and making our plans that if the Lord wills we will do this or that and I don't think this means that we can't plan or we can't achieve in any sort of a way I think of a verse in Psalms it's Psalm 120 it says, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborer builds in vain. And it's basically just saying that we can make all these plans and work so hard at all these different goals, but unless God is in it, then that work is in vain. But the thing about that verse is that the laborers still have to labor. So God is the one who ultimately builds the house and if he's not in it, then that work is in vain, but it still requires our participation. And so I don't think this means that it's bad to plan at all, that we can be making plans and working toward things and still having goals and being good stewards of the time and the resources that God has given us in that way. But in all of that, recognizing that even these plans we make, that it is not a set in stone thing, that it is if the Lord wills. I read something in a blog post earlier this week that somebody had written and it said that God's will is oftentimes disruptive to human plans. And so we can make our plans, but one, we should be seeking God on them and we should be recognizing that his plan might be different than ours and we can make them, but ultimately the plan of the Lord and the will of the Lord is going to prevail. Verse 17, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. This makes me think of a verse in, I think, Proverbs, but it's basically saying whenever possible, whenever you have the opportunity, do good to those in need. And I also want to read a little note from the commentary on this one. It says that this verse is describing what are commonly called sins of omission. It is not only what people do that matters, the good that they fail to do is equally important to God. And so if we have opportunities to do good to people around us and we don't do it, the Bible is outright saying that is sin and dang. So that is James 4. As for our deeper study, I think I want to dig into verse 7 and 8. One, because that is the instruction that James is giving us in response to the sinfulness in our hearts that he is pointing out, the instruction that he is giving us to combat that. And because of that, too, I think that these are really great verses to memorize. So I think that if we spend some time studying them and getting a little bit more familiar with them, that is one step closer to storing these scriptures away in our hearts. So I'm going to grab out my journal and we'll dig in. Okay, so I wrote out that verse. I'll go ahead and read it again. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God, 
Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So there's a lot of things that James here is commanding us to do. And again, it says, therefore, so he has presented to us this problem of sin in our hearts where we have got these passions that are at war within us that are creating these fights and quarrels among us. And so he is saying, in light of that, therefore, do these things. And so to study this passage, I want to pick out all of the words that present a command to us. So he tells us to submit ourselves to God, to resist the devil, to draw near to God, to cleanse your hands, and to purify our hearts. And so I am going to look up the definition of each of these words. All right, so I wrote out the definition of submit first. It says to yield to a superior force or to the authority or will of another person. And then I had also already written out this definition from, I think, a Bible dictionary of submit that I had in the notes here of my journaling Bible, but it says a willing conscious submission to God's authority as sovereign ruler over the universe. And so essentially it is saying to submit our will to the will of God to recognize him as our ultimate authority. And then resist, I'm going to go ahead and look that up. So it says to withstand the action or effect of, to try to prevent by action or argument, succeed in ignoring the attraction of, to struggle against something or someone. I really love this first definition, but I think they all apply to a degree, especially I'm thinking about this one with temptation, to succeed in ignoring the attraction of something that is tempting, particularly sin that might look good on the outset, but really is not. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and write down a couple of those definitions. Next up is to draw near. If you just type that phrase into Google, here is what comes up. So obviously it's two different words we're working with, but the phrase means to come closer. And then finally we have cleanse and purify. And cleanse is to make something thoroughly clean. And then to purify is to remove contaminants from. And then I'm gonna make a little extra note over here for these two, because I read a note in my study Bible, which I'll lift on over here so you can see. But it's saying that cleanse and purify are Old Testament terms for ritual purity. So I'm going to make that note over here. So in the Old Testament, there are rituals that the Israelites would go through for cleansing and for purifying. And then when we get to the new covenant, those are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. And John chapter four is actually a really cool passage that gets into that a little bit more. It might actually be cool to make a video on that. If that's something you would like to see, let me know. But nonetheless, these are all things that James is commanding us to do. So he is telling us to submit ourselves to God, to resist the devil, which requires active participation on our part, to draw near to God, which also requires active participation. These actually all do. And then to cleanse our hands and to purify our hearts. I also wrote down this note from the commentary that says, the only way to resist the devil is by also submitting and drawing near to God. I want to highlight that. So really the only way we are empowered to resist the devil is by drawing near to God. We can't be trying to resist the temptations of the enemy in a vacuum unless we are also drawing near to God and spending time with him. That is the only way we are going to be empowered to resist the devil. And that's also how we are able to cleanse and purify ourselves as well. It is only through Jesus. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says to not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so as we are spending time with God, God, spending time in his word. He is renewing our minds and purifying us and refining us more into his likeness. And so I'm going to spend time praying through this and thinking through applications. And then I also want to challenge you guys this week, and I'm going to do the same for myself to memorize this verse, memorize verse seven and eight, because again, there are so many little promises and commands in there that are so helpful to remember in the moment of need. All right. So that is James four. So good. Let me know down in the comments, what verse stood out to you most from this chapter and why just what you are learning from this series and then if you enjoyed this video please be sure to give it a thumbs up that is a huge way to help support my channel and then also please be sure to subscribe if you haven't yet i will see you right back here next week for james chapter five bye